Well, good morning again. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I'm Scott Hickox, the lead pastor here, and we're glad that you're here. And I was going to do this at the end of the service, but frankly, it's just too important to wait. So I just want to make this clear in case you were wondering, uh, but my expectation is that everyone will be rooting for the Chiefs today, okay? <laughs> um, yeah. It, it, I mean, if you care about your pastor, all right, it, uh, it has been 50 years for us, so uh, I think... Anyway, it's going to be a good day, I hope, so let's cheer for the Chiefs. Well, next week, uh, next week we're going to be starting a new sermon series uh, on the book of Colossians, and, and what I hope we'll see there when we get into that book is, uh, is just a picture of how Jesus pursues us. No matter what uh, we're going through, through good times and bad, He always uh, pursues us, and so that's what we're going to see in the book of Colossians. That starts next week. But today we're, we're looking at this passage, a story, and I think, I think this story reminds us that Jesus um, is with us no matter our circumstances. And I think it's a, it's a particularly important thing for us to be reminded of, frankly, just because of all the suffering that we see going on around us. Um, I mean, just this week, if you've been paying attention to the news at all, I mean, the world is, is talking about uh, this helicopter crash that happened last, uh, last Sunday. Kobe Bryant and nine others were, were killed. Uh, the news is filled with stories of the coronavirus, which is spreading sort of now uh, to different parts of, of the world. And, and I think both these things are just reminders to us uh, of something that we know is true, and that is that the world is broken, right? Uh, the world's broken. It's full of suffering and, and pain. Those things are real. And, and I think if we, if we spend too much time watching uh, those stories and reading those things, it's easy for us sort of to get sucked into a, uh, just into fear, into sadness, and, and even into despair. So I want us to remember the sermon series we just came out of. We just came out of a sermon series on prayer, where, where God actually invites us to come to Him no matter what we're feeling, no matter what we're thinking, we're experiencing. He invites us to come and to share our hearts with Him. And we talked about a couple of practical tips for prayer in that series, uh, and so I would just offer this. Um, as, you, as you hear stories, if you hear about uh, the helicopter crash, you hear about the, the virus, just, just pause for a moment and pray. You could pray for the people that have been impacted by that, but also just pray for your own heart, uh, that, that more and more that you'd be able to, to trust that God is uh, in control uh, and that you can, you can trust Him. And so I would just encourage us to be more prayerful as we do that. The story we're going to look at today specifically, I think, uh, is going to show us how Jesus uh, pursues us in the midst of, of disappointment and discouragement. That's what I think we're going to see uh, today. So let me just pray for us as we, as we begin to dig in here. Father, thank you that you, uh, that you do pursue us, that in the midst of a broken world, in the midst of pain and suffering that all of us experience at different times and different ways, uh, that you do pursue us, that you draw near, that you want to be with us, uh, to comfort us. So I don't know all the things that, that, that everyone in this room is dealing with this morning, but I'm certain there are heavy burdens uh, being born today situations that maybe even seem unbearable for some. So Lord, I'm praying that, uh, that the message in this passage today would be encouragement, uh, that you do draw near. So Lord, allow us to hear from you this morning. Speak to us, I pray. Uh, and use my words, work in spite of my words. If that, however you need to speak to your people, allow them to hear what they need to hear this morning. Uh, Lord, so we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the story that you just heard read uh, is, is from the Gospel of Luke, and Luke uh, wrote this, uh, and he tells us the story of these two disciples. One is named Cleopas, the other is unnamed in the story. We don't know who the other is. Some scholars have suggested that maybe uh, it was his wife, but we don't know that for sure. Regardless, we know there are these two uh, disciples, and they're walking uh, on this road to Emmaus, and Emmaus is a, is a village outside of Jerusalem, and they're walking on a Sunday morning. Like this morning, except it was, it was actually Easter Sunday morning, the first Easter Sunday morning. <clears throat> All they know, they, they don't recognize that Jesus has actually risen from the dead. All they know is that he's been crucified, and, and they're trying to process, really, everything that they've experienced, all that's going on. So I want us for a moment to try and enter into uh, that space. Just trying to imagine for yourself the things that they could have been talking about as they were walking along, Right? I mean, surely they, they remember the story where Jesus rode on the back of the donkey into Jerusalem and, and crowds of people are waving palm branches and saying, Hosanna. Um, and so they went from that incredible high uh, to the low of seeing Jesus uh, 
got beaten, spit upon, and then crucified. I mean, maybe they had been in the crowd of 5,000 where, where Jesus fed uh, with the fish and the loaves. Maybe they were in the crowd who, who were shouting, Hosanna. Maybe they were in the crowd as they heard people shout, crucify him. But now they're alone on this road. They're alone. They're, they're scared. They're discouraged, disappointed. So again, I want us to try and imagine the, the disappointment that they might be feeling. Remember, these are disciples of Jesus. People who have been walking with him maybe for a couple of years. We don't know for sure, but chances are for, for a while they likely left a family and jobs to follow Jesus. They'd seen miracles. I mean, they'd heard incredible teaching. They had these high hopes. And now they feel hopeless. And in a beautiful picture, I think, of the mercy of God. The Scripture says while they were walking and talking, while they were discouraged and alone, verse 15 says that Jesus drew near. I love that. I, mean, I just think that's a beautiful picture of his compassion and his mercy. You see, Jesus knows that they're suffering. He knows they're in this valley. They're in the desert. They're unsure sort of of what's going to happen next, how they're going to go on. And he draws near. And as I think about this road uh, to Emmaus, this road of, of suffering and, and pain and discouragement, there, there are three kinds of people, right? Those who have been on the road to Emmaus, those who are on it right now, and that may describe some of you in this room this morning. You're, you're in a valley. You're wondering uh, what's coming next. You're wondering how you're going to press on. You're on that road right now. And the third group, for those of you maybe that think you've escaped it so far, those are those that will be on the road to Emmaus. None of us will escape this road. All of us will endure times of suffering because we live in a, a broken world, as we said before. And so we're going to experience seasons of discouragement and, and despair and suffering feeling hopeless, times when we, we just don't understand what's happening or what's going to happen next. And I think the message that God wants us to hear this morning, loud and clear, is that Jesus draws near. Jesus draws near. When we think we're all alone, Jesus draws near. When we think that, that no one cares, Jesus draws near. When we think that, that God has forgotten us, Jesus draws near. When, when we don't know what the future holds, what's going to happen next, Jesus draws near. See, Jesus came to, to take away our sin, but he did, he did more than that. I mean, he took on all of our pain and our suffering. He, he put it on sort of like a, a garment and he went into the tomb and he defeated sin and Satan and he's risen victoriously and he reigns today. And one day, one day he's going to return to make all wrongs right. But until that time, what he wants us to know is that, is that there's someone who's tasted what you're going through, who understands what it's like, and he's, he's triumphed over it, and he wants to comfort you if you'll just trust him. You see, Jesus draws near to be with us and to remind us of that, that glorious truth. But here's what I wonder. I wonder, though, at times if we, if we recognize him. I read a story. Uh, this was some years ago, but there was a, there was a guy. His, his name was Mike, and he, he had gone skiing, um, and, and he was by himself. And, and so he just got in the lift line by himself, and, and uh, another guy gets in line with him. And so they sit down on the ski lift, and they begin to go up uh, the mountain. And as, if you've been skiing, you know sometimes those rides can be a little slow. They stop at times. So they just begin to talk. And after a while, Mike says, well, you know, what do you do for a living? And the guy kind of sheepishly says, well, I'm, I'm an actor. And he says, oh, really? Well, that's interesting. He says, anything I would have seen? And he says, um, have you seen Star Wars? <laughs> um, I mean, it wasn't like there was the guy in the, in the Chewbacca costume. This was Luke Skywalker, okay? He's sitting next to him. He didn't even recognize him. Now, it's one thing not to recognize Luke Skywalker, Okay. It's another thing not to recognize Jesus. But look at what verse 16 says. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Again, keep in mind, these were disciples of Jesus, people who had followed him maybe for years, and they don't recognize him. 
And the question I want us to wrestle with for a moment this morning is just, um, do we? Do, do we recognize Jesus when He draws near? And I would just submit to us, I think there are times when we are just like uh, the disciples. We, we miss Him. We can get so focused on, our, on ourselves, so focused on our pain, so consumed with our situation, and all the things that are happening to us that we, we simply miss His comforting presence. See, we have to be diligent about keeping our eyes open, looking for Jesus. As we just saying, looking up, keeping our eyes above the waves so that we can see Jesus. Because if we're not careful, we'll miss Him at work in the thousands of details in our lives. Well, the story continues. It says these two disciples, uh, they begin to talk to this man who they don't recognize, and they begin to tell him uh, all the things that have happened. I mean, if you think about it, this is a little humorous, right? They are telling Jesus about Jesus, right? They, they, they're the experts. Um, I mean, we have some doctors in the house. I think it's a little bit like, you know, someone who, who spends about 30 minutes on WebMD and comes in and knows all the answers, right, and tells you what you're supposed to do. That's what these disciples are doing here. I mean, they say, are you the only one in all of Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on? And then they proceed to tell him, well, Jesus was this prophet. He was mighty in word and, and deed, but the Pharisees had him delivered over to be crucified. And you see what I find interesting in that is? They knew all about Jesus. They knew all about him. I mean, they had seen his miracles. They had heard his parables. They had experienced his faithfulness. They, they could talk about him at length, but they didn't recognize him. They missed him. And you see, what happens is when we don't recognize Jesus for who he is, then we, we won't trust him like we should. And when we don't trust him like we should, then, then we find all kinds of reasons, all kinds of excuses why His promises and His commands don't apply uh, to us. I mean, God, I know that You say You'll forgive all my sins, but, but You don't know all the things I've done. God, I know that You say I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself, but, but You realize it's 2020. Is that, even, is that even safe anymore? God, I know You tell me to honor my father and mother, but You don't, you don't know how they've treated me. God, I know that your, your timing is, is perfect, but I'm, I'm running out of time. See, I could, I could go on and on, but, but the reality is all of us can make an excuse when we don't recognize Jesus for who He is. We can come up with all kinds of reasons why His promises don't apply to us. But you see, the truth is, um, He is Lord whether we like it or not. And His promises are true whether we believe them or not. But I want us to believe them this morning. I mean, it seems crazy to me that we'd miss Jesus, that, that we wouldn't recognize Him when He actually draws near. But it happens. It, it, it does happen to us when we just get so focused on ourselves, so consumed with what we're going through. That's, that's one of the ways we can miss Him. But there's, there's another way. Look at verse 21. The disciples say, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. You see, they said, but we had hoped. Again, remember the context there. The Jews were expecting the Messiah to come. And when he came, they expected he was going to, to squash the Romans, to, to defeat the enemy, to, to give them to, or bring them to the prominence that, that they felt like they deserved. And based on what they had seen of Jesus, I mean, they'd seen him turn water into wine. They'd seen him heal the sick. They'd seen him raise the dead. I mean, this guy had, had power. He, he could make things happen. And so they had every reason to believe this is the one. See, they expected material and worldly success. What they expected is that he was going to sort of eliminate all of their suffering. So you see, they, they had false expectations of Jesus. That's another reason they missed him. They didn't recognize him because, he, frankly, he wasn't what they were expecting. And again, the question I think for us to consider is, 
Are we any different? I mean, perhaps do we miss Him because He's not what we're expecting? I think so often, particularly in America, I think, but, but we have this expectation. Um, we, we almost believe it's our, our right that, that we'll have happiness and, and comfort and success. We falsely assume that we can sort of work our way to a life without problems. If we just try harder, if we climb the ladder a little higher, if we check all the boxes, if we eat all the right food, if we do all these things, then God, God will reward us. And unfortunately, we even have preachers who, who preach that message today. There's just one problem with it. It's not true. See, Jesus never promised any of those things. In fact, He says in John 16, He says, in this world you will have trouble. You will. Remember three types of people we talked about? Those who have been on the road, those that are on the road, and those that will be on the road. It affects all of us. If we want to follow Jesus, we're, we're told we have to take up our cross and follow Him. And when we do that, if we take up our cross, take up this, this cross of suffering, we're going to experience pain and suffering. We, we, we will be persecuted. Jesus didn't promise comfort or ease. And I think our brothers and sisters around the world understand this a lot better than we do here. Jesus never promised that, but what He did promise is so much better. He promised He would never leave us or forsake us. And in John 16, He goes on to say, take heart, I have overcome the world. See, it's in Him that we have peace. In the midst of our trials, in the midst of our suffering, we're not, we're not alone. He draws near to be, to be with us. And when we recognize that, then we can have peace in the midst of our pain. And, and I believe that's what brings God glory. That's what tells the, the world that Jesus is real, that He's, that he's powerful, and that he's enough. That's the testimony. Now, in saying that, I don't, I don't want to minimize how, how difficult this road is. It is hard. There, there is pain and suffering. It's real. We talked about it. We live in a broken world, and so those things are real. And what we feel and experience is, is real. It can be terribly painful. It can be extremely lonely. But again, what I want you to hear this morning is in the midst of that, Jesus draws near. And He's near whether we feel it or not. He's with us. Psalm 34 says, He is near to the brokenhearted. Church, believe that this morning. Jesus draws near. And I, as I was preparing for the message this week, I read the uh, I read through this passage a lot of times. And in God's mercy, I finally saw something that I had missed probably looking over it 20 times before. And it's something that's very important about the road. I think the Bible is, is really uh, amazing. Every word in here, I believe, is here for a reason, okay? It says their journey to Emmaus. Look at this. Um, at the very beginning in, in verse 13, it says that, the journey was seven miles long. Now, those of you who have been around church, maybe studied your Bible some, what does the number seven indicate in Scripture? Perfection or completeness. That's what the number seven means. So, this Emmaus road that we will all travel at some time in our life is just the right distance. Our pain, our discouragement, our suffering, all of it, will last just as long as God intends it to last and no longer. Just long enough to accomplish its purposes and then it will end. It'll never be too short or too long. So we can take comfort in that fact. The Apostle Paul, um, he endured some incredible suffering in his life. And if you want some homework, uh, go back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and just read this list. Paul gives a list of all the things that he endured. It is incredible. And yet he says in that same book, he says, This light, momentary affliction is preparing for you an eternal weight of glory. 
Now, when I read that list of things he's been through, I don't know how he could say that. I don't know how he could write that, but he had eternity in mind, and he said it. A.J. Gordon wrote a book called The Holy Spirit in Missions, and listen to what he says. He says, William Carey, the father of modern missions, labored seven years in India before he saw his first convert. It was seven years before Judson baptized his first convert on Burma. Morrison toiled seven years before the first Chinaman was brought to Christ. And Moffat declared it was seven years before he saw any evident moving of the Holy Spirit in Africa. Can you imagine that? Laboring for seven years. I don't know about you. Um, I don't want the road to be seven miles long. I'm complaining after a few hundred yards. You see, we live in a, a culture of sort of instant gratification. Um, we, we want what we want, and we want it now, right? I was talking to someone before the first service, and we were just having that conversation. And I said, it's so ironic, because I'm going to talk about that. That's how we live. If we encounter any kind of suffering, any kind of problem, we just we want a quick fix, right? That's who we are as people. We want to be delivered from our pain, delivered from our suffering. And listen, I mean, God could deliver us immediately. He is all-powerful. So there must be some purpose in it when we walk that road. I mean, just think for a minute, think back over your life. Think about the lessons that you've learned. Maybe the times when your faith has grown the most. Again, I don't know about you, but for me, most of those times have come in the midst of some pain or some suffering. That's when we experience the greatest transformations. And you see, if we were delivered from that, immediately we'd miss out on all those lessons from the road. If he rescued us from every trial immediately, we might not see him when he draws near. See, these two travelers are discouraged because of their false expectations. And, and I would just submit to you, many of, I think, our disappointments and our discouragements are the result of the same thing. We just have some false expectations of God. I mean, we expect to be married with 2.5 kids by the time we're, we're 35. That's what we expect. We expect our marriage uh, to be easy, our kids to be angels. We want our job to provide well for us without any uh, kind of problems. And when those things don't happen, many times we, we immediately assume, well, God must not care. God must not be near. You see, those false expectations keep us from recognizing Jesus for who, for who He truly is. We, we, we have to have proper expectations first. And maybe to get our expectations in order, I'll just ask a couple of questions. I mean, what, what do we actually deserve from God? I mean, was the, the sacrifice of His Son something that we, we deserved? The love and acceptance that we've received, something based on, on, on something we did? I mean, we know the answer is no to that question. We, we don't deserve anything from God except punishment. And yet He extends us grace upon grace. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is grace. It was, it's what makes Christianity different from every other religion in the world. He gives us what we don't deserve. He, he receives us with, with open arms in spite of all of our brokenness and our sin. And I believe as we begin to understand that, then despite our circumstances, despite our suffering, we will, we will more and more be able to do what James tells us, to count it joy when we experience trials of various kinds. Well, let's look back at the story. After listening to them, Jesus, Jesus can tell that they are discouraged, that they are despairing. He knows they need some encouragement. They're in, the, they're in the valley, and so he's ready to kind of to step in. So what is Jesus going to do? Is he going to give them a, a list of things to do? Uh, maybe a, a motivational speech, tell them just to, to suck it up? That's not what he does. Look at, look at verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You see, what Jesus knew was what they need more than anything it's me. They need to understand me. 
We need to understand Jesus. So where does he go to to give him this picture? He goes to the only uh, scripture that was available at the time, the, the Old Testament. He wanted him to see how every story in the Old Testament has been about him. See, he was trying to give him confidence that he really was who he told him that he was. Now, you might think that, that the resurrection, that Jesus rising from the dead, you might think that would be enough proof. But evidently, Jesus believed it would be even more convincing to show them that, that every page of, of a book written by over 30 different authors over a, a time span of 1,500 years had consistently told one story, and it was all about him. You see, from cover to cover, the Bible is a story of redemption from beginning to end. It's the story of a holy God reaching down to rescue lost sinners like you and me. That's what the Bible is. It all points to Jesus. Now, we don't know. It it doesn't tell us specifically, so we don't know exactly what Jesus said that day. But I can imagine it, it might have sounded something like this. And if you want to just close your eyes and listen for a moment. In Genesis, I was the Word of God creating the heavens and the earth. In Exodus, I was the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, I was the high priest giving you access to God. In Numbers, I was your ever-present guide, your pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, I was the prophet coming who was greater than Moses. In Joshua, I was the conquering warrior leading you into the promised land. In Judges, I was the broken Savior rising up to rescue you. In Ruth, I was your kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, I was the pure-hearted shepherd king who rushed out to face your giants all alone. In First and Second Kings, I was the righteous ruler. In First and Second Chronicles, I was the restorer of the kingdom. In Ezra, the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, the rebuilder of everything that is broken. In Esther, I was your advocate, risking my life to restore you to royalty. In Job, I was your living redeemer. In the Psalms, I was the one who hears your cries. In Proverbs, I was wisdom personified. In Ecclesiastes, I was the meaning that lets you escape the madness. In the Song of Solomon, I was your lover and your bridegroom. In Isaiah, I was the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, wounded for your transgressions and bruised for your iniquities. In Jeremiah, I was the spirit that writes God's laws on your hearts. In Lamentations, I was the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, I was the river of life, bringing healing to the nations. In Daniel, the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, I was the ever-faithful husband pursuing my unfaithful bride. In Joel, I was the restorer of all that the locusts have eaten. In Amos, I was your burden bearer. In Obadiah, the judge of all the earth. In Jonah, the prophet cast out into the storm so that you could be brought in. In Micah, the everlasting ruler born to us in Bethlehem. In Nahum, the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, your reason to rejoice even when our fields are empty. In Zephaniah, I was the Lord, mighty to save. In Haggai, the cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, the pierced son whom every eye on earth will one day behold. And in Malachi, I was the son of righteousness, rising with healing in my wings. Isn't that amazing? But you see, the Bible doesn't end there. The New Testament reminds us that he wasn't just promised, but he came. In Matthew, he's the king of the Jews. In Mark, he's the son of God. In Luke, he's the savior born to us in the city of David. In John, he's the word become flesh dwelling among us. In Acts, he is Christ, the risen Lord, proclaiming salvation to the nations. In Romans, he is the justifier. In 1 Corinthians, our resurrection. In 2 Corinthians, our sin bearer. In Galatians, he redeems us from the law. In Ephesians, our righteous armor. In Philippians, the God who meets our every need. In Colossians, the firstborn of all creation. In First and Second Thessalonians, he's descending from heaven with a shout, coming to meet us together in the clouds. In First and Second Timothy, the one mediator between God and man. In Titus, our faithful pastor. In Philemon, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. In Hebrews, our great high priest. In James, the life at work and our faith. In First and Second Peter, our living cornerstone. In First, Second, and Third John, our advocate pleading his righteousness in our place. In Jude, he's our God, our Savior, the one who keeps us from stumbling and presents us blameless in his presence with great joy. And in Revelation, 
He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. It has always and only always been about Jesus. I mean, He is the center of all of it. And you see, God gave us His Word so that we would see Jesus, so, so that we would recognize Him, so that we would see Him when He, when he draws near. And when we see him like that, I mean, we can't help but be changed. And if it happened, it happened to these two lonely, discouraged travelers, and we're going to see that in just a moment. And I just want to tell you, it can happen to us too if we keep our eyes open, if we remain in the Word. Now think about this. Look, look at verses 28 and 29 for just a second. It says, so they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. How far am I going to read? Just 29 for now. All right, so think about this. Of all, of all the places that Jesus could be after the resurrection, he's in Emmaus. I mean, this is a, this is a nothing town, Okay? And he's with two disciples. One, we don't even know their name. Of all the places Jesus could have been, he's nowhere with two nobodies. And what's he doing? Let's look at this, verses 30 and 31. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. So what is Jesus doing here? I would submit to you that he is doing what he was always doing in his ministry. He's hanging out with sinners. He's having a meal with sinners. They are doubting. They're confused. And Jesus breaks bread with them. I mean, my favorite title of Jesus in all the Bible is Friend of Sinners. That's who Jesus is. And so he goes with them, he he shares a meal with them, and immediately their eyes are opened and they recognize him. Their eyes are opened when they're at the table sharing a meal with Jesus. And so what we see in the passage is Jesus coming and he's taking these, these two disciples from sadness and discouragement to a place of hope and joy. He's taking people who are unbelieving and sad, they're discouraged, they're they're rebellious sinners, and he's taking them from from brokenness and discouragement to joy and hope. That's what he does. That's how he works in the world. He moves people from brokenness to joy. And he wants to do that in your life too. Luke gives us this beautiful picture of Jesus drawing near to people who are brokenhearted. That should give us hope this morning. And I want you to just look at the result. Look at how the story ends, verses 32 to 35. And they said to each other, did our hearts, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. You see, their hearts burned when they, when they saw Jesus. When he opened the scriptures to them, it says that their hearts burned. You see, these disciples encountered the risen Christ. And they can't contain themselves anymore. They immediately go and tell their friends because they're so excited. You see, it's all come together for them. This really is Jesus. He is who he says he is and he rose from the dead. See, when Jesus drew near, they couldn't help but want to tell others about him. And so I'm just going to conclude with a, with a few questions and then one last, one last story, and we'll be done. So I just want to ask a couple of questions. Just be honest, uh, just between you and the Lord. Just think about these questions. And my first is this, do our hearts ever burn when we think on Jesus? When we open the Bible, when we read about Jesus, do our hearts burn? When's the last time your heart burned for Jesus? 
Are we compelled to talk to others about him? And the last question is just, do, do we see him when he draws near? I mean, Scripture is clear. He does draw near. And so the question is, do we see him? Do, do we recognize him when he does? I'm going to close with a story. It's the story of Job. Again, if you've grown up in the church, or you, you know the story well, but Scripture tells the story of a man named Job. He was, he was a righteous man. He was a, a blameless man. One of the things we're told about him is that, that he got up early in the morning every day and offered sacrifices just in case his children sinned the day before. That's kind of the kind of man Job was. He was righteous. But even righteous Job endures some incredible a suffering. He loses his wealth and his children all in a single day. And then he's afflicted with these sores all over his, his body. And despite the counsel of his wife, he continues uh, to worship God. Time goes on. He gets, he gets some really bad advice from, from some friends. And towards the end of his, his seven-year road to Emmaus, he, he begins to wear down and he just asks God why. We're all prone to ask that question. Job asked. But God didn't answer his question. Instead, a God asked Job some questions. He started with, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? And by the time God is finished with his questioning, Job realizes the magnificence of God. He recognizes his own sinfulness. And finally, Job says this. He says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now, but now I see you. See, this was a righteous man, and yet he obviously needed some severe trials so that he could really see God. And so my prayer for us is that God would use our road to Emmaus, our, our road of suffering and, and discouragement to open our eyes, that we might see Jesus when he draws near. And their hearts would, would burn within us. And we would just be compelled to share His glory with others. That's my prayer for us. So let me pray to that end right now. Oh, God, thank You for Your Word. Oh, thank You that this entire book is about Jesus. That You long for us to see Him. To see Him as He is. Oh. So Lord, would You give us eyes to do that? you allow us to see you, to, to recognize you when you draw near to us, even when we don't feel it, Lord, could we believe that? And Lord, would that make our hearts burn? Would we know your great love for us and would we just then be compelled to want to share it with others? Lord, this road is hard and, and we need your presence. We need your comfort. You are the God of all comfort. So would you comfort I'm sure the suffering in this room right now is enormous. So Lord, we need your presence. Would you comfort your people this morning? Would you let them know that you are near, that you are with them, and that you will never leave them or forsake them? Would you let them know that this morning? I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.